This is a Polaroid back for a Hasselblad. Before digital cameras, you'd use these to test exposures, especially helpful for flash photography. But when Fuji discontinued their FP100 line of peel-apart film, these backs became essentially useless, which left a void for a Hasselblad instant film back. But in the last few years, there had been a push to create an instant back that uses Instax film. But in my opinion, those backs had several deal-breaking issues. Some backs used Instax mini film, which would crop into the Hasselblad 6x6 frame. And if I paid for the full square, I'ma get the full square. Second, and probably the biggest issue, those backs had the focal plane shifted backwards, meaning you'd have to shim the focusing screen to compensate. You'd also lose the ability to shoot at infinity. While they were solid attempts, they had big enough flaws for me to pass on. And then I found this. This is a Nons Instant Back. This film back accepts Instax Square Film, which allows you to shoot full frame with the Hasselblad. This also solves the focal plane issue, so there's no need for a shim. At first blush, this kind of checks off all the boxes, so how is it? Functionally speaking, it works about as well as I could have hoped. The issue I'm having now is learning the film. I've only shot Instax film casually with actual Instax cameras like this. These cameras have no real meaningful controls, so with so much out of my hands, I never really looked at the film critically. You get what you get. If it looked bad, it might have been the camera, it might have been the film, it could have been both, who knows. But with this back, it allows me to actually have full manual controls. And what I now realize is this film is actually kind of temperamental. The first thing I noticed is how contrasty it is and just how little dynamic range it has. If you look, you can see how quickly the highlights get blown out and the shadows get crushed. But regardless, this was a successful first print. Uh, one interesting thing I noticed is that the printed image is actually larger than a standard negative. On the negative, the actual image measures around 55 millimeters square, whereas the print is about 58 or 59 millimeters square. I don't know where the extra couple millimeters come from, but it's something interesting to note. And another thing, these prints come out sideways. Normally with an Instax Square camera, these prints would be facing this direction with the chin towards the bottom, but with how the back is configured, it ejects the film from the side. Honestly, I don't really care, but if this really bothers you, you could just turn the camera 90 degrees, which is the benefit of shooting with a square format. I went outside on an overcast day and I shot a few frames, and these shots came out kind of overexposed. So this stuff is 800 speed film, which is what I rated these shots. And this one came out kind of okay. You have details through most of the frame. The cars up here are kind of blown out, but it really could have used them under exposure, but it is usable. These two, not so much. Again, this was shot on an overcast day and the lighting was flat and pretty even, or that's what I thought, but the skies are just completely blown out. There was a nice cityscape up here, but you just can't see anything. So you just have to trust me on it. So I went around and I underexposed by a stop and these results were better. Again, the sky is completely washed out, nothing salvageable there, but overall it turned out better. So I went to a shady wooded area and I exposed it at box speed. Yeah, like I said, temperamental. But after messing around a little bit, I managed to dial it in. But again, blown highlights and crushed shadows, more of the same. But all of these issues are just with the film. But after shooting a few packs, I did make a few observations. First, this is a well-built machine. I've never used another Nons product before, but I've only heard good things. And if this back is anything to go off of, I wouldn't have any problems buying from them again. But it's not a perfect product. I do have several issues. First are some long-term concerns. This outer housing has this rubberized coating on the surface, and it feels nice and it looks nice, but it is a fingerprint magnet. But more importantly, I worry about this kind of coating because from my experience, this type of material usually turns sticky and gooey over time. I can't say for certain if that's going to happen or if it won't, but it is a concern and it's in the back of my mind. Next is the battery. This uses a non-user replaceable rechargeable battery. In the short term, it works great. I shot two packs on a single charge with no problem. My issue is I hate batteries. They are a guaranteed point of failure in any system and when they do fail, I would like to be able to replace them easily. I haven't opened this up yet to see what kind of battery it takes, so I don't know what that operation would look like. I just wish it would have used replaceable batteries like all the other Instax cameras. And on the topic of the battery, this charges through a USB-C port, which I'm really grateful for because pretty much everything I use now is USB-C, but it can't charge with USB power delivery. It can't charge through the USB-C ports, but it will charge through the USB-A port. It's honestly not that big of a deal, but it's just a little annoying. 
Next, this back doesn't work with EL cameras. It just doesn't mount. The bottom part here protrudes just enough to bump into the motor and it won't snap in, so it just doesn't work. Next, the dark side is apparently not 100% light tight. They mentioned that the dark side will only reduce light leaks temporarily. Now, when I read this, I was kind of bummed because not being able to swap backs is kind of a big problem. I mean, that's one of the benefits of shooting a modular system. So when I put my first pack in, I committed to shooting all 10 frames before swapping out the back. Now, I did shoot this test frame and then removed the back and shined a light all around the dark slide for a minute, and I didn't see any light leaks. But this is just one test. This is a positive sign. I feel like now I could probably swap out the backs in the field without worrying too much. Another thing I realized is that this film advance gear right here actually grinds up against the dark slide. And that's because on a normal back, the dark slide comes in on the other side. And you can see where the gears meet with the body on a normal back. So I shouldn't wind the camera with the dark slide in. Finally, it's really easy to mount the back without actually fully mounting it. When mounting it back to the body, you don't want to forcefully push the back into the body to clip it in. You want to slide this latch over, get it flush, then let go of the latch. With a Hasselblad back, it's either on or it's not. There's no intermediate stage, which is not the case with the Nons back. It's actually easy to have it land somewhere in the middle. If you look right here, you could see those two little clips are kind of shining through. So you could actually pull the back off without that much force. What you have to do is you actually have to push the back in a little bit further until you hear this click and then it's locked in. You have to be extra careful just to make sure it's seated properly. And those are just my observations with the hardware. Now let's talk about the shooting experience. It's clunky. Here are the order of operations. After mounting it, you take out the dark slide, you take your shot, you turn on the back, and then you press and hold the film eject button. I wonder if they could have somehow streamlined the process. On a Hasselblad, when you press the shutter, this little pin right here pushes out. And if they were able to somehow incorporate this into an auto eject system with the back, that would have been cool. I feel like if the dark slide wasn't in the way, they might have been able to install a little button here. But anyway, as it is, the manual eject operation is just kind of annoying, but this could just be a me thing. I'm just so used to shooting this camera in a certain way that adding additional steps kind of throws me off. I'm sure if I use this more, it'll become second nature. With that said, there are benefits of having a manual eject button. It makes it easy to trichrome. Obviously this wasn't done well, I was having some problems, so I tried it again in a more controlled setting. Yeah, it came out a little overexposed and a little magenta. So I tried it again by underexposing the red and blue channels, but then having the green channel at box speed, it seemed like it was a little too much. So I just underexposed all the channels by one stop. It looks better. It would have helped if I had more granularity between the controls, like being able to adjust a half or a third stop. But knowing it is possible, I'm definitely going to explore this further later on. Now, one final thing I want to touch on is the price. I paid $300 for this. At the time of recording, it's $280 for the back and $20 shipping to the States. And I get it, $300 is a lot. If you just want to shoot Instax Square, you could just buy a proper Instax Square camera for half that price. But if you want to shoot instant film on Hasselblad, of all the Instax backs that I know of, this is actually one of the cheaper ones I've seen. But also to put this into perspective, I feel like this is the spiritual successor to this Polaroid back. And to give you a comparison about the cost, here's a magazine from 1990. And if you flip through the ads, here's a listing from a little known camera store. They were selling Hasselblad Polaroid backs for $310. The list price for this Polaroid back in 1990 was more than the Nons back is today. But if you take inflation into consideration, the Polaroid back would cost around $730 in today's money. So yeah, $300 is a lot, but historically speaking, not a bad price. Overall, this Nons back is a solid piece of kit. It works as advertised and pretty much does everything I need it to do. I do have some long-term concerns, but something that I can't really fully address until some time has passed. I feel like I've barely scratched the surface of what this thing could actually do, and I'm really excited to see what other stuff I'm able to do with it. Gnome.